Good afternoon. Welcome to the weekly livestock market update. I'm Brownfield anchor reporter Megan Grebner. With us, as always, to talk all things markets, University of Missouri Scott Brown. Good afternoon, Scott. Good afternoon, Megan. A busy end to the week for us uh, when it comes to reports, and we'll talk livestock slaughter, cold storage, cattle on feed numbers, probably talk a little drought in there as well. But to kick things off, let's recap what happened this week in the markets. Yeah, on the cattle side this week, Megan, um, positive news for the most part. Uh, Live cash cattle were up $2 uh, on the week. That actually puts them uh, nearly $22 above where they were a year ago at this time. Feeder cattle prices were steady to three higher this week. On the future side, the June live cattle futures contract was up $2.10, and the May feeder cattle contract closed up $1.90. On the beef side, choice box feed prices were actually $2.50 lower on the week. That actually puts them $10 below where they were a year ago at this time. Uh, we did have uh, weakness in uh, rounds, briskets, and, and uh, short plates this week. Uh, on the hog side, cash barrels and gilts were up $2 on the week, and the May Lean Hong Futures contract was down $0.75. Cents. The pork cutout value gained $1.25 uh, as we saw strength in ribs on this week. It'll definitely be interesting to see what happens with cattle futures when things open up on Monday, and we'll get into that more a little bit later. Let's talk slaughter numbers. Obviously, uh, holiday week last week, so a little bit lighter in in some cases. How are we measuring up? Yeah, so uh, for the week ending April 23rd, a run of 665,000 head of cattle this week. That's uh, 31,000 head above uh, what was a slowdown last week, uh, but unchanged relative to a year ago. And on the hog side, a run this week of 2.374 million head of hogs. That's 33,000 head above a shortened week last week, but uh, 97,000 head below where we were a week ago at this time. First report out this week, livestock slaughter numbers. Um, Talk to me a little bit about how those numbers shape up. Yeah, so the 30,000 foot view to begin with, uh, beef production for March uh, up 1% relative to the previous year. When you look year to date, we're up 1.8% in terms of uh, beef production. Uh, cattle slaughter uh, in March was up 0.3%. It's up 1.6% year to date. Uh, weights have been moving higher. So that March weight was up seven tenths of a percent for cattle uh, in year to date up 0.2. Uh, when you start looking at some of the individual uh, categories here of slaughter, beef cow slaughter certainly sticks out uh, uh, up 141,000 head for the first quarter of this year. Uh, relative to a year ago. On the pork side, pork production uh, for March down 3.6%. That actually makes it down 5.3% year to date. So for the first quarter of of 22, um, hog hog weights were up a half a percent uh, and year to date hog slaughter down 5.4%. The beef slaughter number (laughs) jumps out at me a little bit, but I'm going to hold that for us to talk to uh, in a little bit because it's very interesting looking at it. And then when we're going to talk about cattle on feed numbers, cold storage uh, also out this week. As we take a look at that, it really looks like we're starting to build and grow back some of those stocks. Yeah, that's certainly the news out of the out of the cold storage report that we got today. You know, if you look at the beef side, uh, 537 million pounds of beef. Uh, at the end of March in coolers. That's 11% above where we were a year ago at this time. Uh, Pork overall, 487 million pounds of pork uh, at the end of March. That's 8% above where we were a year ago. Uh, Just to put the sum of beef, pork, chicken, and turkey together, um, 2.1 billion pounds of those four meats. That was a little more than 4% above where we were a year ago at this time. So some building now You look at some of the individual components, uh, loins were actually uh, down uh, slightly uh, this this year relative to a year ago, Uh, but uh, most everything else, turkey was also actually down. I I think there we're seeing some of the effects of uh, high path AI affecting uh, uh, turkey freezer stocks at this point. Um, that was I was going to follow up with that. I, I, as we look at that and, and knowing it's still going and it's well, it slowed a little bit in some areas, there's still some anticipation that it's going to create some challenges. Do we anticipate seeing 
turkey stocks shrink, uh, at least in the near term? Yeah, I, I think that's some of the hardest hit when you look at the poultry categories, uh, just given what's been happening to, to turkey uh, flocks and, and high path AI, of course, eggs as well has been another one that I think is has seen more impact because of uh, high path AI. Uh, the, the chicken side of this equation, though, up five uh, percent in terms of chicken uh, ending stocks for March uh, relative to a year ago. So it, it is it is a mixed bag, but I think turkeys is the one we need to be paying the most attention to. Maybe that mean, means our wing stock will <laughs> grow. Let's, as well. let's hope those wing prices might come down one day, Megan. Right. <laughs> You and me both. The, you know, I'm a house full of boys and, and those uh, growing twins are huge chicken wing fans. And it, uh, I about fell over purchasing a two pound pack of chicken wings in comparison to where it was six months ago. Yes, they are. They are, have been very high. All right. Cattle on feed out today. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know if there's a proper descriptor for what uh, most people are probably thinking when they take a look at those numbers, or at least not anything we can say here. <laughs> can we just say pass and not talk about it today? <laughs> Oof, <laughs> like, not great. <laughs> a little <laughs> concerning, all things that make uh, probably are PG enough that we can share here today. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so interesting enough and We'll take cattle on feed here to begin with. Uh, so on feed as of April 1, uh, came in at 101.7. Uh, that's actually a percentage point uh, plus outside the upper end of the pre-report range. So more on feed than we anticipated. Uh, placements in March totaled 99.6% of a year ago. That's nearly four percentage points outside the upper end of the range. Uh, so we, we certainly had more cattle placements and, and on feed numbers than anybody would have suspected coming into that report. Uh, I suspect you've correctly identified that uh, cattle futures will be fairly bullet, but sorry, bearish when they open on Monday. I think everybody collectively groaned. <laughs> or maybe everybody is going to groan on Monday morning when, when they open. All right, so here's where I wanna come back with this. That beef cow slaughter number that we talked about in the livestock slaughter, would have maybe set up a probably a pretty different expectations for what happened in today's cattle on feed report. Where is that disconnect and what does that mean? I wish I knew the answer to that question. I'll, I'll start there, but, but, but it's worth talking about as, as well. So I, I will say, have we been pulling cattle forward? Yes. Uh, drought has certainly made us want to place uh, cattle in feed yards sooner than normal when we didn't have pasture for them, didn't have wheat pasture. I mean, you, you name it, all those things were, were pulling forward. You know, at, at the same time, I, I sometimes say, are we going to run out of cattle by the end of this year? You know, we keep placing them at the rate that we are. I, I go, I don't think we can continue to do that. Um, when you look at beef cow slaughter and just the pace, and, and by the way, we did get heifers on feed data as well this, this time. And there's no indication, you know, that we're holding any heifers back at this point. So I, I, I sometimes wonder how you reconcile everything, except that when we get tight, we'll be very tight. We're early, we're, we're early in this discussion. And I think later in 2022 and into 2023 is when we start seeing much tighter supplies of slaughter-ready cattle, not today. Um, but, but at the same time, I, so I'll take beef cow inventory that was down and, and say, you know, are we, are we fundamentally having some problem in collecting data from beef cow side relative to cattle on feed? Um, and I'm not throwing USDA under the bus when I make that statement. I just it seems like there's some confusing, confusing data here. Of course, beef cow slaughter certainly backs up smaller beef cow inventory, like USDA has been saying. So uh, it's, it's just, for me, the connect between cattle placements and uh, beef cows that has me kind of scratching my head and only saying, I think if once we start getting short, it could be pretty short on placements uh, moving forward. 
And this isn't, this isn't something that we can grow quickly, right? Like it is a multiple year investment for us to start rebuilding to a point where it makes a difference. So just like those tankers that have been stuck in canals, it takes a big momentum to, to move them once they're stuck. And I think this is a case as well when once we get short, we'll be short for a long period of time. And I guess one of the concerns is, so we've had, we've had all this food inflation discussion. And if we're right about how short cattle supplies could get, we're not done talking about higher beef prices. And then the question becomes one of, do consumers at some point say enough? Uh, I, I don't need those higher prices, especially maybe if other commodities don't run as high. Now, having said that, we're doing nothing but tightening on the pork side this year as well. So there's not great alternatives, but uh, it, it's, it's something that we're going to have to watch going forward. I hate the term a perfect storm, right? Like it's very sometimes overused, but I feel like we're setting ourselves up for a very concerning, and I don't want to be alarmist either. I don't want to say food supply issues, but, but definitely tighter supplies. My other question is, and this is way out of left field. Does that mean we potentially get to a point where we have to import more yeah. product? Yeah. So, so good question. And I'll say no, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly say no to that. So let's, let's, let's rewind here for a minute. So we've been pushing per cap supply, domestic per capita consumption at, at back at record levels. And you just back up to about 2014 and, and we were a good seven, eight, nine, 10 pounds below where we sit today. And even with what we're discussing, I, I don't think we're talking about that extreme of a cut uh, coming in the next couple of years. Yes, tightening up, but um, not, not that extreme. So consumers shouldn't be worried about product. It's just prices probably go higher trying to handle what's less supplies to domestic consumers, or maybe we just export less meat as well. Always plenty for us to talk about. Uh, I'll be really good at this after it's all over to tell you what happened. You will definitely be the expert when we have this wrapped up. We should take our show on the road. <laughs> there you go. All right. As we look ahead to next week, uh, a much less busier, busy week. Uh, what are we watching for next week? Yeah, so we get restaurant performance index at the end of the week, Megan. And then we're going to talk a lot about drought and uh cattle movement as well next week. So just if you have questions, if you want Scott, if you want to throw Scott all of the curveballs, uh, go to brownfieldagnews.com. You can also subscribe to our newsletter, which comes out every Saturday morning, but you can also submit your questions and comments there as well. And if you're looking for some great podcast material while you're in the cab of the tractor, go to brownfieldagnews.com slash podcast. Scott, great to see you. You as well, Megan. Have a great every <laughs> have a great weekend, everybody. I'm Megan Grebner for Brownfield.